So I'm going to talk about um, time symmetry in operational theories and also, uh, if I have enough time, on this nascent idea of conditional frames of reference. Um, and uh, this talk is based on a, a very long paper I put on the archive. It's 149 pages um, uh, a short while ago. Um, this diagram is, is a, a diagram of one of the proofs in the paper. I won't have time to go into that proof. Um, so let me start. Um, so here's the, the story of time asymmetry uh, versus uh, symmetry in quantum theory. And this, this is, I, I don't want to pretend to be a historian. I'm sure one could um, be more careful about this story. Um, but so in 1926, Schrodinger's equation came along, which was time symmetric. 1932, uh, von Neumann collapse, uh, which uh, is time asymmetric. Uh, According to Wikipedia, Heisenberg actually uh, w w was the first person to think about uh, this uh, projection in 1927. Um, in 1964, uh, uh, Haranov, Bergman, and Leibovitz uh, put in place a time symmetric uh, framework. This is a sort of pre and post selected framework, sort of re establishing uh, time symmetry and sort of throwing off um, the, the problem of von Neumann's collapse. Um, but this only applied to uh, pure state quantum theory. Uh, and then uh, the operational approach to quantum theory was developed sort of you know, over a long period in the 60s, 70s, and earlier as well. Um, and um, one of the rules there is that, um, is that um, um, the uh, maps uh, superoperators should be traced non-increasing, but that non-increasing is the forward in time thing. And it, and, um, and this, in retrospect, is time asymmetric, and, and that time asymmetry is, is really um, becomes clear uh, with the Pavia causality condition that the, term, the deterministic effect is unique. Uh, this is a time asymmetric condition. Um, now, recent work uh, on the next slide, I'll just mention some of the recent work, uh, is now pushing back to uh, time symmetry again. So. So it uh, seems like the pendulum is, is swinging back in the time symmetric um, direction. But there are, I, I think, some time asymmetric clouds on the horizon. I mean, there are only clouds if you, um, if you want, if you're, in, if you're on team symmetry, um, um, which I have been recently. Um, and uh, so it may be that time asymmetry will win in the end. OK. so. Um, so uh, recent work uh, on this, so there's the paper by Reshkov and Cerf, which takes an approach to operational uh, quantum theory, which is quite different from the approach I, uh, I'm going to take. There's uh, a paper, a more recent paper by um, uh, Di Biagio, Donna, and Ravelli. Uh, and that paper is, is, is much closer and consistent with the approach I'm taking. And, and indeed, it was a talk by uh, Andrea Di Biagio and conversations with Ravelli that got me uh, interested in, in this uh, subject recently. Um, there's a recent paper by uh, Giulio Kirabella uh, and uh, others. Uh, and then uh, there's the uh, reference to the paper that I wrote recently. Um, there's other work, uh, there's lots of other papers on time symmetry, uh, things that are relevant to what I'm talking about. There's a, there's a reconstruction of quantum theory uh, from by, from diagrammatic postulates by John Selby and others, um, which um, which has some uh, interesting points in it, which relate to the points I'm making, uh, and then other papers as well. And then also there's a, there's a big tradition of work on time symmetry, uh, time asymmetry. Um, so people like Hugh Price, Ken Wharton, Nathan uh, uh, Argerman, um uh, which doesn't directly impinge on what I'm saying, but I think it is, it is a bigger um, field out there. Okay, right. So, so here's standard operational quantum theory, which is time uh, asymmetric. Uh, and so you can give it by stating these two um, postulates. So the constraints on quantum operations are that they should be completely positive. Uh, here I'm giving a diagrammatic way of writing these postulates. There's the, um, so this, this is given by this. So uh, this, the further complete, complete positivity postulate is actually time symmetric. And then there's another postulate 
which is um, is that they should be trace non-increasing. Uh, and this, I've written this diagrammatically like this. Um, uh, this I stands for the, the sort of ignore operation or the, the, the um, sort of the identity where, where you just throw away the system or, you, um, um, and, um, or the trace operation. You can think of it as the trace operation. Uh, and you can see from this diagram, this, um, this is time asymmetric. Um, and this, this condition relates to the Pavia causality condition, because if you saturate this inequality, if you have, if this is a deterministic operation, this equality is saturated, and then it's exactly the Pavia causality condition. Uh, and then another fact that arises in, um, in, um, in operational uh, quantum theory is that you have the Steinspring dilation. So any operation can be written in dilated form. So you have some ancilla prepared in a pure state. Uh, then you have a, a, a unitary operation, and then you trace over the um, some ancilla at the end, uh, and you can uh, realize any uh, any um, process uh, like this. Uh, and you can see this is time asymmetric because here you have a pure state coming in, whereas over here you you trace. So this is uh, different. Okay. So this time asymmetry in operational quantum theory is odd um, for various reasons. So first of all, it's odd because abstract probability theory knows nothing about uh, time. So you know, in abstract probability theory, you're interested in calculating probabilities like probability of x and y or the probability of x given y. Uh, and there's no temporal constraint on the relationship between x and y a priori. Um, they can have any uh, relationship uh, you want. Second point, quantum theory uh, at the level uh, of Schrodinger's equation is time symmetric, is time symmetric as I mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and if that equation is sort of the, the, the equation that's underneath everything, then it's strange that time asymmetry would appear. Um, then um, uh, third point, um, the quantum theory of measurement can be treated very simply without reference to the second law of thermodynamics. So whilst typical measuring um, uh, or, or, or typical measuring um, apparatuses uh, would be quite complicated and so the second law of thermodynamics is relevant, all the salient features of, uh, of, of uh, measurement situations can be modeled within the von Neumann model, um, uh, which uh, is very simple and, and, and you don't need to involve the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, you, you can, uh, of course, give more, comp more, more, you can give models of measurement where you, you do uh, invoke the second law and Carlo Rivelli has, uh, has, give, has done some very interesting work along these lines. So, so we get this time asymmetry in standard operational quantum theory. Um, and, um, and I want to show how to formulate quantum theory in a time symmetric way, operational quantum theory in a time symmetric way. Uh, and actually, the, the work I'm doing will apply to operational theories in, in general as well. So here are the, you know, previously I gave you these, um, these uh, constraints on um, super operators, on, on processes in, in the um, in, in time, in the standard operational quantum theory. Here are uh, what you get in the time symmetric version. So you still have the same T positivity. Uh, 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 axiom. So this is basically saying that if you take the transpose over the input part of the Hilbert space, then the associated operator is positive. Or correspondingly, if you take the same the same thing, if you take it over the output of the Hilbert space, you get the same. You get um, a um, positive operator. Uh, so this is basically the same axiom, the same postulate as before. Um, but then we also have um, this double causality uh, postulate. But I'm going to talk about double properties uh, in this work generally. And when I, what I mean by a double property is that I have one property that pertains in the forward direction in time and another one that pertains in the backwards direction in time. And those are kind of counterparts of each other. So double causality is this postulate uh, that we have this forward causality condition over here and we have this backward causality condition over here. Uh, in this diagram, the I, like I said before, is the sort of trace or the identity or the ignore operation. Uh, we have a time, we have a, a preparation corresponding to that, and we also have a, a sort of measurement corresponding to that. Uh, and the R, uh, as I will discuss later, is the flat distribution, where you prepare a flat distribution. Okay, I'll explain all this in more detail later. Uh, but the important point is that now we have time symmetric conditions. 
uh, on operators. And then we have a dilation theorem, uh, like the Steinspring dilation theorem, but this time we have a time symmetric dilation theorem. So you can see this picture is now time symmetric. Okay, um, so the standard notion of an operation that appears in operational uh, theories uh, looks like this. We have some inputs, these could be quantum systems, some outputs, which could be quantum systems. We have some settings, which could be knob settings. Uh, and then we have some outcomes, and these could be detector clicks or lights flashing, something like that. Um, and if you look at this, you can see it's time. Uh, actually, no, sorry, let me go to the next slide. Um, so if we're, um, if, if we actually look at this more carefully, you can see that the settings, the knob settings, for example, are available both before and afterwards. You can read off the knob setting before, or you can read it off afterwards. Whereas the outcome is available only afterwards and not before. And when you look at this diagram, you can see that it's actually time asymmetric. Uh, so if you pursue uh, this approach, then it's clearly impossible to have a time symmetric uh, formulation of quantum theory. So we want to fix that. Um, and what the way we fix it is by making it symmetric, time symmetric, just by adding an income. So the income is some classical um, um, information that's fed into the um, operation. Uh, and uh, just like the outcome is some classical information you read off out of the op operation. Uh, and the incomes are available uh, before, but not afterwards. Uh, and they're, they're, you know, they're classical, like I said. Um, and uh, an example of an income, if I just go back a few slides to this picture. So an example of an income would be where you send in some classical information, choose um, one of a basis set of quantum states and now send that into the uh, operation. So, so this is an example. Okay, uh, now um, in everything I talk about, I'm not going to be interested, I'm not going to be focusing on the settings, so I'll just uh, make those implicit. So I now just have the incomes and the outcomes and the inputs and the outputs. Uh, and then I'll use this kind of notation um, um, to, to label these inputs and outputs and incomes and, and outcomes. The inputs, so the incomes and outcomes, uh, will take values uh, that are labeled that, that, uh, that are you know one two three etc all the way up to n sub x uh, and likewise the outcomes. Okay, we can wire these operations together, uh, and so when we have when we do this and we have no wires left open, then we have a circuit. These boxes with an x or a y or a z in. Are, I call them readout boxes. Those are, are where you have the the um, income or the outcome, so to speak, read out. Um, and um, when you form a circuit like this, uh, we're interested in joint probabilities. Um, so probability of x, y, and z. So probability of this being x, this being y, and that being z. Uh, and this is a joint probability of the form incomes, comma outcomes. Uh, but there are different points of view. So the point of view I just outlined is the time symmetric point of view where we calculate joint probabilities of incomes, outcomes. We can also take a point of view where we calculate the probabilities of outcomes given incomes. That's the time forward point of view and the time backwards point of view where we calculate the probability of incomes given outcomes. Um, the, the paper by, um, by uh, uh, Di Baggio, Donna and Ravelli uh, concerned these two points of view and the sort of symmetry between them. Okay. Whereas in this in this uh, talk and the paper associated with it, I'm more interested in in the um, the top point of view. The standard operational framework is in the time forward point of view. So I now want to work in the the time symmetric point of view. Uh, if we have answers in one point of view, we can convert to answers in the other points of view, uh, just using the usual rules of, of conditional probabilities. Uh, so, um, so really, you kind of have a choice here, and I'll talk about conditional frames of reference at the end of this talk, so you'll see how that pans out. In the time symmetric point of view, we demand that we get the same answer for, the, for this joint probability, incomes, outcomes, whether we did the calculation forwards or backwards in time. Let me give a definition of what I mean by a time symmetric theory. 
So we demand two things. In operational theory is time symmetric if uh, associated with every operation, there is a time, a time reverse of it. And you can see the time reverse has the inputs and outputs flipped. Uh, and likewise, the incomes and outcomes flipped. So the X and the Y are now in the reverse direction. And, the, and these also these incomes and outcomes. Uh, so first point. The second point, if we take any circuit and we replace each element in it by the time reversed element, so we get the time reverse circuit, then we demand that we have the same probability for that time reverse circuit as the original one. So let me just give you an example to illustrate that. So here's a circuit. And now I'm going to replace A by A tilde, the time reverse, B by B tilde, C by C tilde. So I get this time reverse circuit and I demand that these probabilities are the same. Okay. So this means that for every process described in the forward direction, there's a corresponding process described in the backwards direction uh, and having the same probability. Okay, contents of this talk going forward. Um, well, I'll just go through the talk, but there's, um, I'm going to talk about um, uh, some double properties, something I call physicality, uh, quantum theory, conditional frames of reference. Okay, so double properties. Remember, double properties are where you have pairs of properties, one in the forward time direction and one in the backwards time direction. So here's our, uh, um, if we, we can wire some boxes together and I'm going to leave all the incomes and outcomes open um, like this. And now you can collapse all of this down into one box, just representing the incomes on here on the left and the outcomes on the right. Okay, so M is a classical box, although it has some physics, perhaps quantum physics, hidden inside it. Um, now we can now simplify this a bit further. We can take this M box and we can use this notation for composite systems and represent it like this. So now we just have one wire going in and one wire going out. And this is, this is a very simple classical situation, but it really is useful to consider it. Um, now, Let's um, consider this situation. So now I have some box originally prepares a distribution over over the incomes goes through the M box. I have some I have um, the readout on the V's, and I have a box at the end. I can do a calculation for uh, this for this situation either forwards in time or backwards in time. So if I do the calculation forwards in time, then I have a distribution over the U's. Um, what's this? this is to calculate the joint probabilities. I have a distribution over the U's, then I have uh, associated with this box in the middle, this M box, I have conditional probabilities for each V given each U. Um, and so that's the way to calculate the joint probability. I can do the same calculation backwards in time. So now I have a distribution over the V's from this F box, um, and then I use the conditional probability uh, of uh, u given v to calculate the joint probability. Uh, and I want these probabilities to be equal because it sh I should get the same answer whether I calculate forwards or backwards in time. So I have this. And I can now do the same thing, but I'm going to replace the e and the f by e prime and f prime. Okay. Um, and um, so I get all of this and I get this equation. Um, so now we'll just take those two equations here. And if you, uh, if you divide them and use the fact that probabilities add up to one, then you can show that the distribution over E, so the distribution over U, the E distribution, should be equal to the E prime distribution. Uh, and likewise, the F distribution should be equal to the F prime distribution. This is assuming certain probabilities are non-zero. Um, so this is a bit odd. And what it's telling you is that if you want to get the same answer where we did a calculation backwards, forwards in time or backwards in time, then actually you're constrained on what your initial and final distributions are. Okay, so, so now I want to talk about one way to achieve this uh, double flatness, sorry, to, to achieve this do double distribution uniqueness, that you have this um, uniqueness of the distributions coming in and, 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 going, and coming in from the, from, the, from the past and from the future. Uh, one way to achieve it is to assume double flatness, and I'll tell you in a few slides what double flatness is. Um, 
So, but to do this, what we do is we, first of all, we consider only flat distributions. So R um, is, is a, now a flat distribution. Uh, and normally, sometimes people in the literature use this earth symbol to represent a flat distribution. So maybe that's more familiar to you as a, as a notation. I'll, I'll use this R symbol. R stands for random. Uh, so we have these flat distributions. Uh, and, uh, and then we impose the property of double flatness, which I'll talk about in a few slides. Uh, double flatness is a property that holds in quantum theory. Uh, and it's also deeply, deeply related to some causality issues. Okay, so since we're only considering flat distributions, these are the kind of circuits we're considering. We always have these R boxes uh, on the on the ends. Um, okay, let me now discuss double flatness. So just really stare at the diagrams at the top of the page. Um, so we consider a box like this, an M box, with a U and a V. Now, if we send into the M box a flat distribution coming in, then we demand that we get a flat distribution coming out. Okay, that's forward flatness. And then we have the reverse direction, the backwards flatness property, is that uh, if we send in a flat distribution then, uh, from the future, then we demand that we get a flat distribution out in, in the past, and that's backwards flatness. And together, those two properties constitute double flatness. And like I said, this property is true uh, in quantum theory. Okay. So uh, now I want to impose some conditions, some physicality conditions on operators. These are just like the conditions um, in quantum, in standard quant operational quantum theory, where you have the operators are completely positive trace non-increasing maps. So I want to do the same thing, but uh, but I want I want these conditions to guarantee first of all complete positivity. So so the probabilities for circuits are non-negative, uh, and secondly. Um, Double flatness, that's the property I just discussed. Okay. Uh, and, and what we have is the, the property of positivity for circuits for, uh, is, uh, turns into this, this mathematical condition called T positivity. This is, um, this is similar to the existing one in standard quantum theory, so I won't discuss it in any detail. And then we also have uh, the condition of double causality. Uh, which uh, gives you double flatness. So if you have double causality, then you will have this property of double flatness. Okay. So, um, so T positivity um, is is is. I'm not going to discuss this this just for the sake of time, but it's uh, a condition that basically uh, um, is similar to the existing condition. So to discuss the double causality condition, first of all, let me um, you know, talk about these uh, boxes with eyes in them. So this box with an eye in it is it corresponds to the ignore. Um, um, well, I call it a result. It's the ignore. Um, it's the box where you ignore this uh, this um, a uh, output. Uh, and in most conventional notation, you'd use this earth symbol. And then the um, then there's this box, which is the ignore preparation. This is where you ignore what's happening before. Uh, and in more conventional notation, you'd use the earth symbol like this. Uh, and um, we can, there's, there's, a, there's a proof in the paper that the ignore preparation, uh, the ignore preparation, this box, and the ignore result, this box are unique coming from some linearity assumptions. Okay, so here's um, the essential uh, property, double causality. Um, in some ways, this is the central um, result of, of the paper. Um, so if the operation uh, satisfies uh, these two conditions, forward causality and backwards causality, uh, then we'll say that it's doubly causal. So let's just stare at these conditions for a moment. If we ignore the input and we send the flat distribution in, uh, then the thing we get is equivalent to uh, ignoring this B and the flat distribution going out. Uh, and the backwards thing is now the same, but in the reverse direction. So you can see this is a time symmetric condition. Okay. And um, if you uh, treat various of the systems in this as the null system, 
then you get lots of different versions of this, simpler versions. So this is the thing I showed you on the last slide. Uh, over here, I've treated the ACE system as null in, in this box. In, uh, in this box, I treated the B system as null. So there's various different examples. Um, interestingly, one of the examples you get uh, if you treat the A and B systems as null is double flatness, the thing I showed you before. Uh, here you can see if you treat everything except the B system as null, then you prove that the um, well, the, the, the forward causality condition gives you that the um, that the um, ignore uh, preparation is unique, and so on. Okay. So let me show you now this double causality principle in action. So here here's a here's a, a bunch of operations wired together. And you can see that uh, on each of these outcomes, I have um, an R box. So I'm, um, I'm sending in from the future uh, a flat distribution. Uh, and we know from, um, we know from uh, backwards flatness uh, that this should be equivalent to the situation where I just have flat boxes coming out for each of these ones. Okay. And you can prove that using double causality uh, as follows. So, um, um, so here's the proof. You start like that, and now I just go through uh, perform replacements. So I replace this one with the um, appropriate um, condition from from backwards uh, causality, uh, and I get this. And then I go one step further. I bring this i down into here, replace that. I get this. I just keep going all the way through, um, and um, through the steps, and eventually I get to this condition. So this one, uh, this circuit, this um, this diagram here simplifies, and there, there are many diagrams that uh, simplify. Uh, so it's interesting to study those. Okay, so so what I was talking about now was really just general operational theories. Now I'm going to discuss quantum theory in particular, and and I'll, I'll use this operator tensor framework, um, which some of you may be familiar with, but it's. Um, um, but it really just look at the pictures they're kind of self-explanatory to some extent this this object here is an operator uh, that acts on a space and lives in a space that's de determined by the um the systems that come uh, into and out of it okay um so in so we get now in quantum theory we get two conditions uh on these operators on, on those operator tensors uh, we get the t positivity condition um, and we get the double causality condition, uh, and this is now written in terms of the um, operators. Okay, and you can see these conditions are time symmetric. Um, a curious issue crops up uh, when you think about this more carefully is that you get these ca these gauge parameters. So consider the ignore operations. So in standard time forward quantum theory. Uh, this box you would typically associate it uh, with the completely mixed density matrix so that's equal to the identity divided by n uh, whereas the um, this box um, the ignore result you would typically associate it with just the identity so it looks like there's an asymmetry in the one case you divide by n in the other case you uh, don't divide by n but uh, actually, there's a gauge freedom, so I've represented it here in this diagram. This alpha parameter, you can choose it to have any real value you like. Um, and, um, and so, for example, if you choose that uh, alpha is equal to 1 over square root of n, then you recover the uh, standard time forward uh, gauge. Um, but you could also choose alpha to be equal to 1 or, or any other value, and it doesn't really matter what you choose. There's a similar gauge parameter beta associated with the um, with the flat distribution. So these are the wires running horizontally. Okay. Um, when you um, you you can prove uh, uh, in in this uh, framework, you can prove that there is a time symmetric dilation theorem, um, uh, which I, I mentioned before, and it looks like this. Uh, and so, um, 
So this now replaces in this time symmetric framework the Steinspring uh, dilation theorem. Um, okay, and then you can uh, use this um, dilation to find the time reverse, to find the operator that's associated, uh, the, the, one, the one that's, that's, that's the reverse of a standard operator, so of, a, of an operator. So here, here's, um, here's uh, uh, an operator, um, and uh, you, can Stein, you can do the Steinspring dilation like this, and then you can find the uh, the reverse, the corresponding reverse operator, uh, and just, and and you just reverse everything. And then what's interesting is you have to take care of these gauge parameters, and and they come in here. And you can see this would have to be the case because um, if I go back a few slides, uh, clearly the time reverse associated with the uh, ignore uh, uh, preparation is going to be the ignore result. Um, but um, but then you can see these alpha parameters have to be involved in that. Um, okay. Okay. So I have uh, I figure about eight or nine minutes to cover conditional frames of reference. So um, so here's um, a circuit, um, and uh, the joint probability associated associated with the circuit is is the probability of x, y, z, u, v, w. Okay, and that's the thing you would typically associate with that circuit. Uh, but you might be interested in, say, the forward point of view, where you're interested in the probability of certain um, outcomes, but where you condition on certain incomes. Okay, so this would be the probability of, of u, v, w given x, y, z. And these um, boxes with the angles on, with the angle sides here, um, are, indicate pre-selecting on the associated variable. Um, pre-selecting on a particular value of that variable. Okay, now when you have a box like this, if you want to calculate the probability, then you can calculate them from 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 these from these circuits. Calculate this probability from those circuits uh, just using the standard uh, rules of conditional probability. So the probability associated with this uh, is given by well that circuit I had before. Uh, divided by the same circuit, except where I've removed the U, V, and W boxes. Okay, and that's just the standard conditional uh, probability rule. Um, uh, Any time you have these boxes which are pre-selecting, there's also post-selecting boxes. Uh, Any time you have boxes like that and you want to calculate the probability, then you have to have a numerator and a denominator, and and and, and do this uh, appropriate thing. Now, if you look at this denominator in this particular case, because we only have uh, pre-selections, you can see here we have on the, on the ends, we have just uh, these R boxes. Uh, and so we know from backwards flatness um, that, that this R box basically goes through and, and we end up getting an RZ box coming from the future, an R Y box and an R X box. So we know from backwards flatness that this denominator is equal to one over uh, n x n y n z. So in this case, the denominator is constant, uh, and in particular, we can write the probability this can, this this uh, probability with uh, with preselected x y and z uh, in this particular form here, uh, where now. Um, I'm um, these 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 boxes with the curved end uh, are, um, are take these particular values. So here we have uh, an n x. This is a constant. It's in a it's in a box. It represents a multiplic multiplicative constant, um, which is necessary because we have that denominator. Um, and so if we use this substitution in here, then we uh, can calculate the probability um, uh, appropriately. And we don't need a denominator. Um, so we can say uh, that the forward conditional frame of reference is given by um, this choice uh, here. Uh, and when we do that in the forward, forward conditional frame of reference, then we end up calculating the probability of outcomes given incomes directly. We can similarly say that there's a backwards conditional frame of reference uh, where we now have this. 
Um, so just now, in this case, the n is on the other side, is on the um, on the other side of the um, on the outcome side, and this allows us to calculate the properties of incomes given outcomes. So it kind of it's kind of backwards in time. Uh, and then we have a time symmetric conditional frame of reference where we have no multiplicative constants. And we just use the uh, original usual association. So this allows us to calculate joint properties. So these three different conditional frames of reference, uh, they, they all have the property that the denominator simplifies uh, to a constant. Um, and, and, uh, and, but they each allow us to calculate different things. So a question is, uh, can we have more general conditional frames of reference? Uh, and the answer is uh, yes. So more generally, we can consider boxes like we can consider conditional frames of reference like this. So here we have a pre-select box. We have some some S box which forms some transformation on this uh, coming in. And then we have a, a readout box in the forward, and then we have the corresponding thing in the backwards time direction. Um, so if we were to take these kinds of boxes and put them in in this kind of circuit. Um, well, one thing, sorry, one thing to point out is because we have these pre-select and post-select boxes, we have to, we have to invoke a denominator. Uh, and in general, this denominator will not be equal to a constant. Um, but one thing that's interesting is if we take this general form, we can simplify it. So, um, so if, if this S box is chosen to be um, just the identity, then we can see that this simplifies to just the pre-selection on X. Uh, and if this S box is chosen to be two back-to-back -back R boxes, um, then we can, then we recover uh, this thing here. So, and, and we can do the same thing in the backwards time direction. So you can see now that you, um, with this kind of special cases, you can recover the three special um, cases I gave you before. Uh, we could also consider more general conditional frames where we have an ancilla shared between S and T. Okay, um, so I gave you these axioms with the, uh, um, with the T positivity and the uh, double causality conditions for, um, for um, the time symmetric oper operational theories and time symmetric operational quantum theory. Uh, if you transform to the forward conditional frame of reference, then um, you recover the standard uh, 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 physicality constraints, the standard uh, conditions I showed at the beginning, basically that uh, operations are completely positive trace non-increasing maps. Okay. You can also transform to a backwards conditional frame, and then you get uh, a sort of backwards uh, operational quantum theory. I'm going to skip through this. I just this is just it's interesting to consider the time reverse of some standard experiments. Like here is quantum teleportation. Okay. Um, so conclusions. Um, how should we interpret these results? So. The, the paper by um, Di Biagio, uh, Donna, and Ravelli uh, has a, a nice uh, section discussing um, uh, interpretation uh, for, for their results, and, and all, all their remarks would uh, pretty much go through uh, here. Um, so I, I would direct you to that paper for this. Another important point is um, how do we port classical information around? Um, so typically, if you want to actually, um, you know, um, if you want to calculate, say, for example, a joint probability or a, dis a conditional probability, then you would think you'd need to have all the information in one one space-time location so that you can uh, do the calculation. Uh, whereas the diagrams I've shown you have the x's and the, the x boxes and the y boxes and so on uh, appearing in different spatial locations, and um, an interesting question is to ask, can you actually transport the, input, the information from the incomes over to where the outcomes are, or, or vice versa, uh, to, to actually calculate the conditional probability? And this, <coughs> excuse me, well, this, this turns out to be problematic. Now, this is, this is the source of the, the time asymmetric cloud on the horizon, which uh, I, I mentioned. Um, this time symmetric frame of reference 
in some sense, it is the most natural frame of reference. I think it, everything looks simpler in this frame of reference. It is, uh, I would say, the analog of the inertial frame of reference in general relativity. Another question uh, is, uh, can this approach lead to better axioms for quantum gravity? So for quantum theory, uh, the sort of reconstruction programs. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful there, you know, I've never been completely happy with any of the sets of axioms that uh, we've come up with over the years. Uh, but perhaps in the time symmetric uh, uh, sort of setting, especially in view of uh, this naturalness claim here, perhaps we'll have a, oops, sorry, perhaps we'll have a more natural set of, um, of uh, axioms. Uh, will this help with quantum gravity? Uh, so this is my real motivation for considering time symmetry. Uh, I think um, it's a lot easier if if you have a time symmetric uh, notion. So um, um, uh, and um, one one particular point here would be this fits in with uh, um, what I've called the quantum equivalence principle. So the quantum equivalence principle says that you can always find a a quantum coordinate system so that you have definite causal structure uh, within the local vicinity of any given point. Um, uh, and we, in, in that context, it would be a lot nicer if you then had a time symmetric formulation of quantum theory. I think it would fit better. It would fit in better with uh, the sort of philosophy of that approach. Uh, here's a challenge, uh, just because Chris was speaking before me, uh, to the cubists. Um, where does the uh, agent's arrow of time come from? Um, uh, one, one, so in, in this sort of framework, the, these conditional frames of reference are a, a natural setting. Perhaps we have associated with us, an agent has associated with them a conditional frame of reference, which is uh, typically a time forward one. Um, but I, I don't have any understanding of the mechanics of that. It would be interesting to think about that from a cubist point of view, especially since, um, you know, typical, um, typical, um, um, the, the typical way of saying which is the forward direction in time comes from entropy, but entropy is a, a quantity that requires probabilities to define it. Uh, so uh, if you need probabilities to define um, a quantity, then you have to start then you have to start thinking about what those probabilities mean. Uh, and then finally, I, I, I'd mentioned already this time asymmetric clouds on the horizon. Um, personally, I don't really care if nature is time symmetric or time asymmetric. Uh, actually, uh, what I do care about is that um, that we um, we are uh, that that we um, use probability theory appropriately, and probability theory doesn't care about time, so we have to be careful to subtract away uh, any part of the asymmetry in our equations which comes from you know an incorrect use of probability theory, so that anything that's left over um, uh, really is a real time uh, uh, asymmetry. Uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you. I can't hear anyone, but uh, yeah, I can't hear you. Is that no, Reinhard uh, has a question. Can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. I can't see you. I can hear you. Okay. So um, this, this, uh, what happens in the infinite dimensional case? So we know that the uh, the time the sym asymmetry between states and observables becomes really pronounced when you really take infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, so the trace class is actually quite different to Banach space from the from B of H. Um, so uh, th this a lot of this seems to presuppose that you have like a, a uniform distribution and stuff like that, things that only exist in finite dimension. So is the world that finite dimensional that you could afford this? Yes, it's a good question. Um, and someone raised a, a similar question last time I gave this talk. Um, so, so one, one thing one can do with is, is play with this double flatness uh, axiom or assumption. So I impose double flatness um, uh, because it seems to agree with quantum theory. Uh, uh, and I was, I'm looking, I, I investigate this in the finite dimensional case. Perhaps when you go to the infinite dimensional case, um, that's not the right assumption. Um, so perhaps one could play with that, but perhaps you could relax that assumption. Uh, uh, um, so for example, you could imagine an assumption where um, Instead of assuming that it's a flat distribution in that gives you a flat distribution out, maybe it's some you know some sort of Gaussian distribution in that gives you a, 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 a Gaussian distribution out. Um, 
um, uh, so so that would be a, a nice place to play with it. Um, yeah. So so my, my 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 real attitude to this question is that it, it's a, it's a fun place to to start playing and seeing if you can relax um, these sorts of uh, constraints. So maybe we'll take uh, one more question online. I think it's from uh, the Oxford group. <laughs> So go ahead and try asking your question. Asking us? Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, hey, thanks for the talk. Um, it was really interesting. So I just wanted to ask um, about, uh, so I think often when, when you switch uh, causality from one direction to the other, uh, you end up, uh, instead of having Uh, only one one uh, effect. You're having only one uh, one possible state, so the maximum mixed uh, state. Mm -hmm. So you may need to repeat part of your question because you froze for a second. Oh, sorry. Uh, so yeah, I'm asking. So often, if you imagine um, just taking the causality condition and switching it around, you would have instead of having a single uh, effect, you would have a single state. So yeah. in your framework, how do you avoid having just a uh, sort of on a conceptual level, um, how would you avoid having this? Okay, so it's true in this case, but let me show you the, um, it's true um, that if you, okay. So um, so one of the applications of double causality is is this box, this here, uh, where, where um, I'm not sure you've frozen again, but I hope you can hear me, um, where you, um, you have indeed just a single state. Uh, so, but if you um, let's see if I can find a different example. But there's there's a greater richness if you go to this more general situation here because um, um, you know you you can send in some some information. So uh, and then you and then you have a more general state. So so um, perhaps one place to think about this is the Steinspring extension. Here, okay. So in this case, now I can send in, um, because I have this arrow coming in from the side, I can send in, in a general thing and um, I'm not sure we've lost Oxford, um, and prepare an arbitrary state according to, to this. So it's it's a richer situation because I have these incomes and outcomes. But it is true that if you have no wires other than the B wire, then you, you have only one preparation. Hi, um, I'm so sorry, but the internet completely died for <laughs> um, almost your whole answer. So, um, so uh, would you mind just summarizing the answer again? Okay, all I said was... Uh, of us here, which, <laughs> but we, we couldn't hear anything. Sorry about that. It is true. It is true if you, if you um, consider the case where you have um, only a B wire coming out, then indeed you just have the, um, the maximum mixed state. That's all you have. So that's here. Um, but there's a greater richness to these situations because we also have these incomes and outcomes. And so those provide um, a much greater richness. And for example, uh, in particular, if you look at the Steinspring extension theorem, you can send arbitrary information in from the income and then prepare, prepare an arbitrary state. So, um, so there's this greater richness and it enables you to recover any calculation you would do in this time forward formalism. You can do it in this time symmetric formalism. So I apologize to anybody else who wanted to ask Lucien a question, but I think we need to move to the next speaker. Uh, so do we have Matt Liefer ready to come on screen? And let's uh, thank Lucien again while Matt's coming on.